We're going to be uh, talking about surveillance photography. It's, uh, it's both creepy and creative. All right. And so we have a fabulous panel here. What I would like to do is I want to give you a little uh, overview first on the, the history of surveillance photography. I'm an educator. Got to get some history into it. And then we will be hearing from our panel. And then at the end, we uh, welcome uh, questions. All right, we're going to hold the questions to the very end. OK. So uh, the, the, the actual term surveillance uh, was derived from a French word. Uh, oh, I need Marco's help. Surveiller, uh, which means to keep watch. All right? And the surveillance camera, as you know, has been used to police borders, assist wartime, to gain advantage over political enemies, or simply to gather information. So this is one lecture where I encourage you to have your cell phones on and tweet, hashtag SVA digital photo. OK. Now, the techniques in surveillance photography are very closely to the development of photographic technology. And the earliest surveillance photos, which we're going to show, to the most recent photography that you know of artists and photographers using uh, Google Maps, Google Glass, and Google Lenses. Now, here is one of the uh, very first, uh-huh, hang on. There's my presentation. OK. So here's one of the very first images. This is actually the first image of a human being ever done. Now, this is Paris, and Paris was not empty. But the man on the bottom left-hand corner is having his shoes cleaned, and it's about a 10-minute exposure. So I think this is the first surveillance photo ever made, because he didn't give his permission, he didn't know, and now we're all looking at him, which I think is just pretty amazing. And uh, that was from 1838. Now, even in the earliest days of photography, photographers were always looking for new points of view. And here we have Nadar, who uh, worked also in Paris in the 1850s, and he was very interested in aerial photography. Now, back then, aerial photography, you had to literally take your wet darkroom with you because everything was collodion prints, uh, plates. And so here he is in his balloon to uh, do aerial photography. It took him three years to develop the process, but I also love compositing. And uh, this is actually how they did that photo. This is his wife. Do you, do you like her expression? <laughs> you know, she's like, what am I doing in this basket hanging from a pole? <laughs> OK. Um, but aerial photography in 1906 was incredibly important because it was used to document the destruction of the earthquake in San Francisco. And the photographer that did that, his name was George Lawrence. He used a, uh, a camera that was incredibly heavy and needed 17 to 18 kites to lift it up to take these uh, really stunning panoramic photos of that destruction. So you've got balloons, you've got kites, you have pigeons, <laughs> okay? Where it was actually developed in like 1909 uh, to put this tiny little camera on a pigeon and then it was a program to take a picture every 30 seconds just like the autographer camera I am wearing today but I am not a pigeon, OK? <laughs> and um, these pictures were very popular at the World's Fair. I love the vignetting with the wings on the top one, all right? And uh, you couldn't really tell what you were going to get, because they didn't really understand composition. And here's a little military pigeon ready to go off. And uh, the camera weighed 1.4 ounces. And it sort of reminds me of a GoPro, right, that we tie to our dogs and penguins and killer whales and things like that. So people have been doing surveillance photography for quite a while. Here in New York City, one of the uh, most important photographers of the 20th century, Walker Evans, developed, oh, he wanted to photograph people in the New York subway without them noticing. And he did this project over the course of uh, four years where he painted his shiny Leica, dark black, and then put the lens through two buttonholes and photographed in the subway because he, he thought that he liked watching the everyday routines of anonymous people. And you know, nowadays, everybody would just be looking at their cell phone and would never look at you anyway. So 
been going on for quite a while. While I was doing researching for this presentation, I couldn't remember this man's name, so I actually Googled creepy photos taken by man with cardboard camera. And uh, Miroslav Chishi popped up. And um, the reason I call him creepy is he built these cameras out of cardboard, and so nobody thought they actually worked. And he would walk around his hometown and hang out at swimming pools and photograph about 100 shots a day. I think he was the first upskirt up photographer. Because this is what he pretty much photographed. So we're getting into the creepy part. So now in the 21st century, we of course have uh, surveillance photography. And I just found this out today. We know about the, the cameras on the, your storefronts, your lamp posts, airports, et cetera. The University of Washington developing a, a system for cameras to speak to each other. So you know how sometimes when something happens and the police say, do you know this person in this video? And they show like a five second clip from a security camera and then the guy, that person's gone. Well, the University of Washington's working on a system that they can recognize you and the cameras will be able to talk to each other so they'll be able to follow you down the street, around the corner, and keep tracking you based on the color of your clothing and how you walk, which is really very, very creepy. So we're being watched. But I think more importantly, we're giving up an incredible amount of information about ourselves. And Eric Snowden said a few weeks ago that if you care about your privacy, you should stay away from Dropbox, Google, and Facebook. But then I would never know what my students or husband are doing, <laughs> all right? So I think in the past, surveillance photography has always been very active looking out, but I think it's very important for us to understand how much information we voluntarily put out there when we search for a vacation spot or the right cream for a skin rash, all right? or when we say what we're doing, or the, M, uh, the GPS information in all of our photos, all right? So there's a lot of very important issues for us to address today, and I'm thrilled that we have a fabulous panel here. I'm going to read their uh, brief bios. Believe me, the bios do not do them justice um, in the order they're gonna be presenting, and then we'll take questions afterwards. All right, so first to present is gonna be Christopher Gregory, Chris says he goes by his base in New York City and he works extensively in his home country of Puerto Rico. His current project, which Chris is showing us tonight, Los Carpeteas, focuses on telling the story of one of the largest surveillance projects conducted by the US government on its own citizens. Okay? Then we have Hei Rung Min, who's a graduate of MPS Digital Photography. Uh, he's a South Korean photographer living and working in New York City and Heirun will be showing work from her project, Channel 247, which aesthetically references surveillance photography. Andrew, Andrew Hammond, came in from Boston. He's interested in using photography to interrogate the intersection of technology, privacy, and image culture within America. Andrew will be showing work from the New Town, which is presently included in the Open Societies exhibit, Moving Walls 22, Watching You, Watching Me. And then finally, David Fine is a product manager at PlaceMeter. And PlaceMeter was created to give people the power of knowing what a place is like before they get there, which I think is just fascinating. And David has worked in the tech startup and media space in New York, LA, and Dallas, and he'll be showing us what and how PlaceMeter gathers, analyzes, and shares information. So please help me in welcome our first speaker, Christopher Gregory. Okay, and I will start your, I'm, the, I'm also the tech person. Like, great, great. Okay, so I'll just have to do that. Thank you, and thanks everybody for, for coming out. I know it's a little rainy. Um, so can we pause this though? There we go. All right, great. Um, so I'll give you sort of a, I'm kind of like the, the, the resident historian of the lot. Um, 
my project focuses, I'm from Puerto Rico, grew up there, um, on a, one of the largest and longest continuous surveillance programs conducted by the U.S. government. Um, so I'll give you just a brief history of Puerto Rico, just in case. Um, we were acquired by the U.S. in 1898 in the Spanish-American War. Um, in 1917, uh, everybody that lived in Puerto Rico that was born in Puerto Rico was given U.S. citizenship. Um, and basically, what was interesting about that particular legislation in 1917 was that there was a sense that, like Cuba and later like the Philippines, the territories that were won in the Spanish-American War would eventually become independent. Um, that wasn't the case with Puerto Rico because when they made Puerto Ricans U.S. citizens, they drafted a lot of them to the First World War, and it became a very important military outpost in the Caribbean later, and more importantly, um, for the fight against communism and um, totalitarianism down in South America. So um, this program started around the 1930s, and it was conducted primarily by the FBI, um, and it was specifically targeted at the pro-independence movement. So anybody that was roughly associated with the, the Nationalist Party, the pro-independence party, or anybody that was sort of seeking for an alternative landscape, political landscape, um, was heavily persecuted. And the first iteration of it was a list of everybody who was a member of the Nationalist organization. Um, so I'll just start going through these and kind of give you some more history on them. Uh, these were compiled by essentially what was the secret police in Puerto Rico, which is the, um, the intelligence division of the Puerto Rican Police Department. Um, this particular division and the Puerto Rican Police Department was founded by um, a, a few members of the police, of the insular police, that were heavily trained by the FBI. And so a lot of the money from this, um, for this particular program came from the federal government and the FBI and a lot of um, sort of initiatives like later on Cointel Pro. Um, so this is what you're looking at. So essentially um, my project focuses on sort of select people that are a good indicator of, of what the, the extent of this program was like. Um, this is one of the largest ones. It's about 4,000 pages and it's 30, basically 30 years of this person's life documented. Um, what you see inside of them are newspaper clippings, if they were politically active. Um, if they weren't, you know, what, who they had coffee with. They have timelines, 9.30, 9.35, left, you know, the bodega. Um, and, and there was sort of the, the level of inter, 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 like how they intervened was anywhere from you had no idea you were being surveilled to this man who was a university professor and had a undercover agent in each one of his classes for about 20 years. Um, and then, so this is, this is one of the earliest artifacts I have, which is from 1949, a year before a uh, particularly um, violent revolution in Puerto Rico. Um, and it's a surveillance note of people coming out of, of this building, which is now actually a really nice bar and restaurant if you're ever in Puerto Rico, but used to be the nationalist headquarters. Um, this is Josie's um, carpeta. She basically was, was targeted um, as a result of participating in rallies. So she showed up to, a, you know, in a pro-independence rally and she was also very involved with particular p political prisoners that had been uh, imprisoned um, during demonstrations or violent acts in the US. Um, but she had no idea that she was being surveilled. And what's interesting about this surveillance um, was that a lot of these primary documents and information were collected from um, government organizations. So that is actually sir, her high school yearbook picture. Um, and so basically all of civil society had involvement in this operation, essentially. Um, when it was all said and done, there was about 185 data points. So about 185,000 people were surveilled. Um, which amounted to thousands and thousands and thousands of hundreds of thousands of folios, um, only in Puerto Rico. There are also federal files that currently nobody really knows what the extent of is because they haven't been declassified. Um, most of the people I photographed have federal files as well that they've been able to FOIA. Um, so the extent of that, that operation that are FBI and English files um, is, is pretty extensive. Um, 
what, what ended up happening was that you created sort of a cottage industry, and this is what I think is interesting culturally about this project, is that agents and informants and anybody who was providing information to people were, were paid. So this is a list of all 600 people that attended the, the burial of the, of the son of one of the uh, pr most prominent pro-independence leaders. And if you look at the numbers next to each one of those names, those are all the file numbers, um, most of them recited by memory. So this guy just kind of showed up and wrote everybody's names down um, and compiled these lists. So people were paid anyway for anywhere from $20 to $40 uh, per report, and this is the 70s. So it was, it was a massive operation. Um, which in involved a lot of money. Um, and then also what started happening was that these in informants would, would essentially take this money from the government, but what ended up happening was that agents would specifically target um, spouses, brothers, sisters, neighbors. So what ended up happening was that everybody around you may or may not be an informant, and on top of that, um, when this eventually came out in the 80s, I'll, I'll talk about what that, when that moment was, um, people found out that brothers, sisters, spouses, their neighbors, people that they thought were, were the closest to them had been informing on them to the police. And what that meant was that you couldn't hold a job, um, you couldn't um, work in any public you know, enterprise, I mean, you couldn't work for the government. Um, and a lot of these people made their living um, either as lawyers with private practice, um, obviously because of their experience with the law, um, or um, working for companies that were owned by people that were sympathetic and in the movement. Um, so here, this is actually a really interesting carpeta. Um, he, so here you can actually see the the names of the FBI agents that signed out is sort of a chain of custody of the carpetas. Um, what ended up happening in sort of the late 60s and 1956, from 1956 to about the early 70s, was Cointel Pro, which is, an, which is a, a program started by the federal government targeting um, any leftist and communist movements in South America. Um, you know, famously in like El Salvador and Nicaragua and like all these other places. But in Puerto Rico, um, it was essentially a domestic fight. And the FBI had a, a much larger um, kind of cache of resources to give to the Puerto Rican Police Department and to conduct their own surveillance in Puerto Rico. Um, and part of that at that moment was also um, very intense kind of gag laws and legislation that were, that were aimed at making flying a Puerto Rican flag illegal um, and participating of any demonstration also illegal. Um, he's actually a photographer. Um, so basically, like anything, anything that, that you did that was relatively politically subversive, and by the 70s it was labor movements, and feminist groups, or anybody that was, that was remotely sort of trying to propose an alternative landscape. And what's interesting, I think, about this project and what I'm trying to kind of convey is that, you know, I myself was a person that didn't really think about surveillance and wasn't really, you know, sort of engaged with that, um, with that idea, that notion that, you know, I want to protect my privacy, like we all do, but what I think is important and what this project shows is that the potential for abuse is really where, um, what we should be talking about. Um, the surveillance itself, um, out of all of these folios and all of the surveillance, nobody was ever convicted of a crime from evidence that came out of these files. But um, I think a whole, you know, a whole series of like three generations of Puerto Ricans weren't able to exercise their political speech in fear of um, the, the authority. Um, and this is also a really early artifact. This is in 1947. This is a march. Um, to commemorate uh, a pro-independence rally like back in the in 1800s. Um, but you, you can sort of see with pen like each one of the numbers and everybody identified um, in the rally. And this is 1946, 47? And this is directly FBI agents um, that were trailing these particular groups of people. 
This is interesting. This is the first meeting he ever went to to the pro student, the pro independent student federation. So the pro student pro independence. It's hard to translate. The pro independence student federation was sort of the organization that was most targeted. Um, if you went to a meeting, they immediately wrote down your list, and your name on a list, and you were a file was opened on you. And this is the first entry in this person's file, which is the first meeting he ever went to. So if you never went back, your file would be one page. Um, but if you continued in the movement, then um, you would be followed. He was followed home one night, and, um, and the two cops basically manipulated a shotgun when he stopped at a red light. Um, and you know the, the fear and the intimidation of the surveillance process was so strong that you know, I mean, he didn't know if he was going to go to sleep that night and, or if he was going to get shot by, by the cops. Um, this is one of the most tragic stories, which is of Doña Pupa. She, she was a, a, a big, sort of a prominent leader in the, in the movement and, um, and founded the, the, the Movement Pro Independence, which is one of the organizations in Puerto Rico. But she um, owned two pharmacies in her life. The first one was blown up by, by the police, um, killing two employees, and she was framed for bomb making. That's actually a picture from 19... I want to say 30s. It's 1960-something. Um, and she had to leave her hometown of Mayagüez and move to, this, to the city and, form an, uh, and create a, start another pharmacy. Um, when she started that, it was also firebombed, um, killing nobody, but she was framed again. And um, because of her political prominence, it was in the newspapers. Um, and this is her now. She's really cute. Um, but basically... Um, sort of the gist of it is I think that, that when we talk about surveillance, um, th the idea that, that, you know, I have nothing to hide and that we're sort of surveilling ourselves, right, by posting our statuses on Facebook and saying that we're here, um, we don't need an informant. Um, but the, the potential for abuse um, is real. And I think that really it lies in the power to control speech. Um, anybody sort of in Puerto Rico who wanted to join this movement was, was completely singled out and, and sort of thwarted from even being, being able to assist a rally and sort of meet people. Um, her, her son was actually very active in the movement and to sort of give you an idea, and this is all be, this will be my last story, uh, of the extent of it was that um, she was his bridesmaid. She was the godmother of her, his first child and um, gave him his first car. And this was a relationship over 25 years. Um, and it turned out that over those 25 years, he was the agent assigned to surveil her that entire time. And, you know, he came over to eat every night. Um, so the relationships and the, and the potential for the institutions to abuse the, not necessarily the information, but the act of surveillance um, I think is an important kind of conversation to have, especially going forward now that the NSA and all of these things are, are sort of coming to light. So, that's it. All right. Okay. Let you get out. Okay. Hey, Rung, I'm going to get your presentation here. I got it. Normally not my, okay. Oh, oops. Oh, you can do that or the keyboard. Forward. Okay. Thank you for uh, coming. I'm very excited and honored to be here. Um, um. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, the project I'm uh, going to share tonight is Channel 247 that I made uh, in 2010 uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, for this series, I photographed uh, passerby and uh, neighbors uh, from my place throughout the window frames, uh, treated as TV. 247 is not, it doesn't mean 247 that you guys think, but it's just a house number that I had. Uh, one day, uh, my husband, a boyfriend at the time, um, 
and I needed to rearrange the furniture in the house and we've decided to move the dining table near the windows um, in the curved construction constructed uh, in the living room and we sat next to each other not facing each other and from that day I just happened to start watching out uh, people on the, from the uh, windows every day and all day for several months. Well, I've always loved to um, take a window seat um, whenever possible and um, get lost watching people for hours at a time. So um, it was not a surveillance photography project, uh, even though it looks like the photos uh, were taken from Google Street View before people blur the subject. However, uh, it has the point of view of surveillance uh, camera aesthetically, and I think I played in the borderline between public space and private life. Most of the time, uh, my subjects are in the public place, and I don't have any intention to break the privacy in my, uh, for my photography project. The situation uh, in my photograph or not anything like newspaper would publish or um, shocking anybody. Um, but because it was very subtle and anything that could happen to me, the process uh, of photographing itself calmed me down and gradually helped myself to step out of the box that I didn't want to break in that period. I felt more comfortable staying in my place than going out and facing the real world at the moment. In my own imagination, I could walk as they walk. I could talk, laugh, or go out for, to work as they do. And I found myself living Vicar vicariously through them, their lives becoming my, my own. Sometimes I feel sympathy and I'm happy for them as they become my family and friends in my own channel. This might be only photograph that my subject in, is in his house. I don't know if you guys can see. Um, I just love to find him um, doing, you know, he's doing exactly what I was doing just without the camera. Sometimes the channel had a special seasonal broadcast such as Mr. the softy ice cream truck during the summer, midnight party, backyard parties where illegal tattoo service was offered to ex-convicts um, who were full of confident laughter and loud cursing. And one next morning, everything was gone just like nothing happened. I wouldn't know what happened. Uh, they had a party every single night during the summer for years, and I was just happy that it was gone and I could sleep at night. I also like to find a little sense of humor that people put on them. or little and quiet, simple gesture that they made uh, was very peaceful, and I could get lost in thought watching them. Also, we had um, the West Indian American Day Parade at 4 o'clock in the morning. 
and the next day, everybody's like, you know, whole, whole neighborhood or festive and very normal to, very casual to see, see them costumed like that. Also, um, as I fell into uh, my channel 247 day by day, I started noticing the repetition helped me understand their basic characters, my actors' basic characters, and the nuances and differences um, offered me clue of their hidden stories. There are moments when people are oblivious of others or simply don't want to be mindful of anybody other than themselves. What I have found was that those moments could, could be more revealing of um, their personalities than they, when they try to make a good impression on others. This uh, little boy was you know, uh, leaving the flyers, and he was my favorite character. Uh, I named everybody. He's a stylish papa. He was the stylish guy in the whole block, and he, whenever he comes in and out, he cleans the little, uh, uh, the entrance, and, you know, check the garbage. So the boy just passed by, and a second later, he came out, and, of course, he couldn't stand with any garbage in his house. Those moments happen between things, such as when you are rushing out to work in the morning, or taking out the garbage, or maybe just sitting on the stoop daydreaming. And of course, there's a day that I don't want to see the channel rainy day, I just shut down and nobody came and I just enjoyed myself without TV. Next to me in Brooklyn was a day daycare center and um, there was a gay couple who had little boy with one of fathers taking him to the, cent the center in the morning and the other one picking him up at the end of the day where each parent had very different energy. He's the one, I don't know, you can see in the morning. He's the one in the evening. And I could see each parent has very different personality. How the parents treat their kids can't hide their emotion on the given day or in individual character. Here again, stylish papa. <clears throat> However, they might never imagine how all that information might be so obvious and plain to see. In my teens, I couldn't help but think that somebody was watching me all the time, so I, could, I had to act as a main actress in some kind of movie, uh, which made me feel very self-conscious wherever I went. It might be typical of many other teenagers, and it might even play a part in how one creates a sense of self. I remember when the movie Truman Show came out in 1998. It opens with the question, what if you are watched every moment of your life? It completely matched my imagination. The movie went on to show how, he, how Truman would really feel after he realized the truth of his condition.
which lead me to ask, how different is our behavior when we are conscious of others around us? And what do involuntary actions tell or reveal about us? This photo, for me, tells me that it was time for me to let them go to their world. Because I don't photograph my subject when they are in their house. For me, the kids were escaping from me, just like the Truman did in the movie. And I thought that this guy was making sure that um, making sure to lock the door so I couldn't be able to photograph them. I didn't even open the folders um, after making copies every night until I moved up from the place. For my selfish reason, the process was more important than what my subject were actually doing. In the end of the project, it proved that I was the one who was trapped in the little box. And when I eventually left the neighborhood, I had to unsubscribe Channel 247. And this photo uh, was the last one that I took on the day of moving. Thank you. Okay. So, and now uh, Andrew Hammond is going to talk about his project Newtown. And I'm sitting here going, perfect sequence. Everyone was like, perfect. So, this will play automatically. Andrew. Thank you all for joining us. So a few years, years ago, I was on the internet and I found a web forum that was discussing how to use Google to access various devices that were networked through the internet. One whole forum was dedicated to finding webcams that had been indexed by the search robots over at Google. So I started looking through all these webcams. There are a few thousand results. Some were boring cameras on an empty dog cage. Some were security cameras inside a mall. Some were just of an empty parking lot at night. All fairly uneventful cameras to watch, but every camera that successfully loaded was exciting regardless. You never knew what you would see when the next image loaded. Eventually, I stumbled onto the camera that I made this work from. Immediately, I was drawn to it when I noticed how it was different from the rest of the cameras I had been watching. This camera was fully controllable. I had options to pan, tilt, zoom, control the focus and exposure. Besides this, when I panned the camera around, I noticed I had a full 360 degree angle, or degree of view from the town and a highly elevated point. So I started watching. Some of the first people I saw on the camera were a mother and daughter simply walking down the street. Just seeing the motion on the camera was fascinating for some reason, so I zoomed in and started making photographs. From here I started making photographs daily, watching the residents, following them as they went about their day. And nothing was happening. It was totally boring and uneventful. There was something strange and exciting just about being able to watch and control this device. Once I had been making these photographs for a few weeks, I decided I wanted to try to do some research and find out more about the camera. So the first thing I did was delete the syntax of code in the URL, and I just went to the IP address that the camera was located on. So by doing this, I was taken to an email login page. I took the email address that was there, and I started Googling around to see what I could find. I found that the email belonged to a housing developer who was the founder of this new small community in the Midwest. I soon found out that the camera I'd been watching was in fact this town's webcam. It was located in a cell phone tower that was mounted on top of a church in the center of this town. As far as I could tell, it was owned by this housing developer and used as sort of a tool to promote the town. So visitors to their website were invited to use this webcam to explore the town and see what it had to offer their families. Beautiful new homes in a planned community, 
green parks for their children to play in, white picket fences, a perfect utopian small American town. So for over a year, I watched and photographed this town, researching along the way. Interestingly, I found out why the plot of land had not been developed on until the developer purchased it. The land that this town sits on, it sits within a 500 and 100 year floodplain, meaning statistically within 100 or 500 years, the town could possibly be destroyed by a catastrophic flood. Also, the area is near the New Madrid seismic zone, which is a major fault line in the Midwest that many say is overdue for a major earthquake and that FEMA says could result in widespread damage and social and economic loss. Websites and documents I found for the town discuss the values of the community and their expectations for their citizens. They promote the town as a mostly walking community. They encourage neighborly interactions. They talk about children playing happily in the playgrounds and even taking the family for movie night in their outdoor amphitheater. What I find bizarre is that by the founder installing a webcam to promote the town and its values, he took away the privacy of the families playing in the parks and the children swimming in the waterways and the couples drinking coffee at the outdoor cafes. Can the idea of a small, quiet American community exist when you never know if or when you are being watched, or more specifically, if you don't know by who? I'd like to point out that none of these images are altered or photoshopped. The extreme pixelation is caused by the low resolution of the camera itself. And because these are literally screen captures, uh, there are two types of what I'm equating to a new photographic grain almost. One are the large blocks of colors, which again are due to the low resolution of the camera, the webcam. And the second are actually the fine pixels, which are from the resolution of my screen display. So these images were made and accessed in an entirely virtual manner. I think this is an important aspect of the work, as our world has been shifting towards an entirely virtual and digital system of networks. Emails, family photos, financial information, social media, all these aspects of our lives are out there on the networks and now the cloud, potentially to be accessed by anyone who knows how. Many people ask me if I've ever been to the town, and the answer is no, I have not. All of these images were made from the privacy of my own bedroom in Boston. By watching the space for over a year from this single camera, I was able to become familiar with a few repeating characters. I only na named one of them, though. One citizen I was able to see on almost a daily basis is this one woman who lives closest to the camera. You've seen her once or twice already, but... First time I saw her, she was sitting on her porch, and I watched her for about an hour. She was just sitting there drinking coffee and texting on her cell phone. Because I don't know her name, I simply call her Cell Phone Girl. I was soon able to recognize her and her dog as I would walk around town. I also started to recognize her boyfriend at one point, and I even know where he parks his truck. There was also the priest that would come out, at, uh, come out of the church after church service, and even the barbecue man who would be outside smoking meats at the local barbecue restaurant. I'm often asked if I feel any responsibility towards the town or the people I photographed in regards to their privacy and the moral and ethical obligations associated with making photographs of people that are unaware. I think this is an interesting aspect of the work that I'm trying to complicate and question myself. I should mention I have made an effort to not include uh, many identifying aspects, such as street names or house numbers or license plates on cars. And even if anyone wanted to try to identify these people in the photographs, the low quality pixelation or the pixelated images, they don't really hold up to scrutiny. Their identities are kind of obscured by the technical or technological limitations. And on that note, I've always been fascinated by the fact that much of our technology has no sympathy and no discretion. There are many cameras and devices that are networked, and they are continually streaming images and information onto the internet, many of which are saving and recording data. Of course, this is changing. Almost all of us have smartphones that are made to make our lives more convenient and more efficient. There are even home automation systems that know when you're home and can adjust your thermostats and even computer systems and robots that have advanced levels of artificial intelligence that are used within production, medical fields, uh, and even in government and military applications. <clears throat> Actually, if anyone's seen the Terminator movies, this is exactly how the Skynet system took over, by creating a digital defense network that claimed to take away human error by allowing the computers to make decisions for us. 
And if you think this is far-fetched or futuristic, I would invite you to Google Boston Dynamics. They're an engineering and robotic company. They're about a half hour drive from where I live out in Boston. They make humanoid robots for DARPA, and guess what, now they're owned by Google. So I guess we haven't seen killer Google robots take over the world just yet, but even the idea of one of the biggest internet companies owning a robotic manufacturer that works for a government is quite interesting. I think at the very least, it shows evidence of a certain paranoia that someone thinks at some point we should have networked defense robots. Bring this back to the photographs. This camera may have been installed as a fun feature on a website, but the reality is this is a simulation of what is happening on a much larger domestic and international scale. The main difference being that the large-scale surveillance happens behind closed doors and collects much larger amounts of electronic data on us. So I started making these uh, photographs about two months before the Boston Marathon bombings. I was actually sitting in my apartment about a mile and a half away from the bombing site, making these photographs as it happened. I wasn't directly physically affected, but it was still a confusing time for everyone in the area. Cell phones had been disabled in the city, um, apparently because they could be used as, a, as detonation devices. So in the confusion, we had to go to the internet for all the news and updates. I remember over the next few days, people were crowdsourcing photographs from the event that had been posted online. And uh, these people online were using these large amounts of photographic data to try to identify possible subjects or suspects. A few people who were at the event were falsely identified because of this, but the results look not unlike these photographs. Tight images of people who were just there, hyperpixelated, strange images. The images appear as evidence of something, but really are just photographs. Thank you. That was the creepy part. <laughs> now, um, it's a pleasure that uh, David Fine from Place Meter is here. Um, David works with some really smart people. I mean, people that hold PhDs, a number of patents, and really understand like visual communication and how we can use a lot of this data. And there's so much data that David and Placement are one of these companies that are trying to put a little, make a little sense about it. So, David, you want to come up? Let me get the right presentation. Okay, hang on. Okay. Perfect. Good. Great. Hi, I'm David. That was incredibly disturbing, and <laughs> I know Andrew uh, considers that a compliment. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm here to, it's, it's really apropos, and I think Katrine uh, did this intentionally, that I'm going right after Andrew, because um, I'm here to talk about PlaceMeter, uh, which is a company that's trying to take uh, what we just found so disturbing about Andrew's work and um, make it not disturbing and understandable to people. Um, and what we're really trying to do is build a real-time layer um, that indexes the real world in real time. Uh, what that actually means, we'll get to, but first I want to talk about cities and how they've been growing over the past few decades. So this is a chart uh, uh, graphing city population growth in the United States from 1950 to today. Um, so you see that rural population is flat, but city population growth um, has just uh, more than doubled uh, since 1950. Um, and it's, it's a story that's, um, that's pretty old in America, actually, of growing cities. It started at the turn of the century, and it's not stopped since. But what a recent development is that increasingly these cities are digitized. Um, so in 1994, we have Netscape, uh, which is the first consumer web browser, the first way for people to really access the internet in an easy um, and uh, understandable way. Uh, in 1998, we have Google, uh, which indexed the internet. And then in 2007, we have the iPhone, which brings all of that mobile and ushers in this new age of mobile um, uh, digital movement throughout a city. So the first implication that we derive from that is Uber. Um, without these distributed 
networks of mobile phones everywhere, we couldn't, Uber couldn't exist. Um, but there are kind of these larger um, implications and movements that are emerging out of these large mobile distributed digital networks that layer atop these large urban physical dense layers. Um, and this movement uh, is trying to analyze and crunch that data and really understand it in a way to improve cities, or at least that's what um, they say. And uh, the, uh, the, the name that has emerged, the buzzword, so to speak, uh, that has emerged out of this movement is the smart city movement. And I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It means a lot of things to a lot of different people. But in its essence, it's really about um, uh, uh, quantifying a city, understanding a city, um, and then using that understanding to change a city. Um, there's a lot of debate around whether or not this is actually a good thing to be doing. Uh, so there are people who see uh, the smart city movement and um, on the horizon they, they predict dystopia. Um, they, they think that we're going to wake up one day and um, be in the plots of 1984 or A Brave New World. Um, and there are other people who see uh, the smart city movement and quantifying movements throughout city, uh, people and cars and vehicles, bicycles, basically anything that you can quantify in public spaces as the future of cities, as the way to, to move forward and improve cities. So PlaceMeter uh, sees ourselves as sitting at the intersection of those two views to a certain extent. Um, we think there's a lot of merit in the smart city movement and that, there, um, that eventually uh, humanity will benefit greatly from quantifying the way we move about cities. But at the same time, we think there's also merit in um, the fear that people have of quantifying every single thing we do. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is create a very large, um, very distributed data layer uh, that explains how people move about cities without surveilling them, without uh, uh, infringing on their privacy. And the way that we do that is most ironic um, because we do it through video feeds. Uh, so this is a video feed. Um, it's of Times Square, you might recognize it. Uh, and in here you see people moving about. Um, uh, so what we've done at PlaceMeter is develop algorithms that also see people moving about and then record those people's movements as data in, in a data set that's then uh, consumed by people who care about the data. Um, so while we see this video, our algorithms see that video. Um, and really what you're seeing here is uh, a computer understanding that uh, that object over there is a person and tracking that person's trajectory throughout the frame, saying that person walked through the entire length of the, of the sidewalk, or um, that person has walked in and out of a store, um, that person walked uh, uh, through, uh, across a sidewalk, or uh, sorry, um, an intersection. We're also tracking vehicles, so we say that's what type of vehicle it is, um, uh, how many are moving on a street and how fast they're going. And I'll get into this a little later, but it's, it's important to note up front that we're building this to be aggregate data, to be anonymous data. Um, so we're, we're taking this intensely um, uh, uh, personal and identifiable medium, uh, identifiable medium uh, the video, and making it completely impersonal and anonymous um, and aggregating the data. Uh, but before we get into that, I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit about how our system works. So what we do is this isn't the only video we, uh, we ingest and process on our back end. We have uh, hundreds. Um, and uh, a, a big uh, a, a slice of that is taken from public video feeds, um, kind of very similar to the ones that Andrew um, uh, captured uh, in his project, um, or uh, video feeds that are put up by the Department of Transportation. Um, in New York, for example, you can go online and you can view them. Uh, so we, we ingest those videos. We ingest videos of our clients, people who pay for the data. Um, for example, storefronts that have video cameras that look outside, um, who want to understand foot traffic in front of their stores. Um, and then the third way that we do it is by crowdsourcing video feeds. Uh, so we'll pay people up to $50 a month in New York uh, to put an old Android or iPhone on their window, leave it there, and have that video sent to our back end. Um, so we uh, take all these videos, 
uh, we process them in real time in our back end, um, and we spit out data for them. Um, right now, today, we're in New York. We cover over 250 uh, locations and about 8 million events every single day. Uh, tomorrow, we want to be global. Um, we want to be everywhere. We want to build an ubiquitous data layer. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, what's important for us is to build this without building a surveillance system, um, without building something that could lead to a Skynet, for, for instance. Um, so uh, in order to do this, we've kind of come up with some very basic principles that seem very common sense, um, but that uh, today very few tech companies are pursuing. Um, so we identified kind of the three major ways that uh, a video could um, surveil someone. Uh, so uh, you have the obvious, which is identification, um, knowing that that person is, is uh, David Fine, um, tracking that identified person, and then being able to record those movements and record who that person is. So we've architected our system to not do that. Um, we don't build algorithms that identify people, and, and we made a commitment to not do that. Um, we try to minimize any human interaction with the video. So outside of minimal quality assurance, um, making sure that the cameras are set up right, um, we don't look at the videos that we ingest. We only have our algorithms, which collect anonymous data, look at the videos. Um, and then last but not least, we don't record videos. We're not creating a video archive. Um, and what that means is, uh, is this. So um, this is kind of a diagram of how we've uh, architected our system. We ingest the video, can't really point, uh, but we ingest the video, which is the left side. We put it through our uh, servers and our algorithms, which anonymously extract data that's important to people about how people move about cities. Um, and then we delete 99.99% .99 of um, the video. Uh, the important caveat, and, uh, uh, and it's important that I explain this to you because I, I want to be upfront with how we're developing our system, is um, that we record less than 0.01% of the videos because we need a way to gauge the accuracy of um, our algorithms. And the only way to really do that is to look at random recordings, um, very small recordings of our videos, and compare them to what our algorithm outputted in terms of how many people are walking on the street. But what is important here to note is that the way our system is built, um, it's, it's, it's very hard, if not impossible, for, for us to identify anyone. And it's very hard, if not impossible, for us to be subpoenaed for any videos. Um, and it was done very intentionally. We built it with design in, in mind. Um, so, okay, we built this system, we went through great, uh, great lengths to, to not identify one, anyone, not use it for any security purposes. Um, so what exactly do we use it? Why is uh, this smart city application actually important to our city? So the first and most obvious applications are commercial. Um, uh, you're a small business in a city, uh, you're growing and you want to open up more stores. Uh, how do you do it? You um, uh, collect a bunch of data and figure out which store would be the most ideal for your, for your new location. And we can provide an important data point, how many people are walking in front of a specific location versus another one. Um, but aside from the commercial applications, there are just the general larger um, civic applications that we get very excited about. So one, and that's very relevant today, is um, reducing pedestrian fatalities on our streets. Um, so right now, there's uh, very little data about how people move about specific intersections, where there is pedestrian congestion on streets, um, where, uh, where there are a bunch of near misses of people. Really, the only actionable data that the city has now is um, where people get hit the most. Um, but it's not those hits. We want to prevent the hits, but it's the near misses that really um, kind of auger a larger problem with a specific space or an area. So we can provide that sort of data to the cities. Another uh, that's a favorite of mine is, let's say you live in Greenpoint. Um, there's a group of people who do live in Greenpoint who approached us. Uh, Greenpoint in Brooklyn has seen a, a 
pretty massive explosion of growth and popularity in the past few years. And because of that, um, there are people, there are more and more people throwing trash or having to dispose of trash throughout the neighborhoods. They don't have enough trash cans um, to contain this increase in pedestrian traffic. And this group of people have been trying to tell policymakers this for a while. Uh, with our data, they could actually say, you know, we experience a 10% increase in, in overall pedestrian traffic in the past year. You need to give us more resources to, do to deal with that. Um, so, so being able to communicate your um, kind of very classic neighborhood needs in a data-oriented manner to the city is one of the things that, that, we, that we do. But, um, and this is the last one, I'm gonna end with this. Uh, the, the application that gets me the most excited and that we were, uh, that our vision was founded on was the ability for, in the palm of your hand, to understand um, how busy a place is. And, uh, and, and that's the future that we're trying to build. Know how busy Central Park is before you go, your local bar or restaurant, how busy and how big the line is at Trader Joe's before you go. Um, those simple, uh, uh, kind of common sense things that will really make people's lives and cities better. Um, that's the future that we're trying to build and we're trying to build it without surveilling people, without building the next Skynet. Um, and that's Placemeter. Thank you. Fascinating. But I have developed a skill of shopping from that line <laughs> and whole recipes of things you can reach in the Trader Joe's line. Seriously. So um, I'd, I'd like to open it up uh, to questions. If anybody has any questions. Okay, I'm ready. I know I have a question. So, um, and if we do have a question, unless I'm saying we have to repeat it. So Chris, the, for me, the obvious question is, is how did you get access to all of those stacks of paper and archives and people? Um, so what ended up happening, um, was that in, um, in 1978, uh, there was a, a really famous, um, essentially entrapment of two students by an undercover agent. They were taken to the top of this mountain um, under the <coughs> pretense that they were gonna blow it up in an act of patriotism. Um, and when they got there, they were ambushed um, by about eight police officers and assassinated. Um, in the investigation of that particular incident, the existence of a secret police came out um, because a few of the agents that were there were, especially one of them, who was recruited out of high school. Um, and in the investigation, it sort of came out, and then in 88, um, in the summer of 88, um, on a radio program, um, a government official kind of slipped and said that, of course, everybody that was uh, pro-independence was being surveilled um, and had files. And so that prompted a big um, investigation, and there was a big um, court case, and the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico basically said that the information that was contained in those documents belonged to the people that, um, that it belonged to, um, and gave it back to them. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting, and particularly I think um, sort of why this project sort of has a big resonance, especially in the States, apart from the fact that this exact same type of surveillance was done on the Young Lords and here in New York and the Bronx and on the Black Panthers and all of these you know, sort of social movements, is that it's an unredacted look into the technique of surveillance. And it's physical surveillance. It was completely unwarranted and unconstitutional wiretaps um, and literally people following you. Um, so I think that it's, you know, those documents um, thankfully were returned and are sort of a touchstone of, of like how surveillance actually happens. But of course now, there aren't two dudes parked outside your house, um, you yeah. would never know. He's wondering about my process about making the actual photographs through the device and, and how I kind of approach that, you know, if I went out with the intention of kind of looking and making these images or I've made a lot of images and then edited afterwards. And, um, I, I think it's interesting because I, I always carry this point and shoot with me. It's a little RX100 Sony, and I make photographs for my daily life. And um, a lot of these photographs, no one sees, or they don't make it into an edit of any sort. But <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I uh, so for this work, basically every day for over a year, I would I would sit down at the camera and or sit down at the computer and open up the web page and just start watching. And often I didn't know if I would make one photograph or a million or a thousand, whatever it might have been. Um, 
And so they're literally screen captures. So when I would see motion, you know, I might zoom in and investigate it and kind of see what was happening. It might have been a, a dog walking around or some kids playing in the park. Um, and I think it was kind of that photographic intuition similarly to how I make photographs for my daily life. It, if it was something that aesthetically looked interesting, I might start making images from it. Um, and if it was someone walking around, I might start following them and making more photographs. And, you know, so of course there's a large amount of, of data that was a result of this. And so from those images, I would go through and edit. So you guys saw 30 today, and I think there's about 20 or 30 in the exhibit at the Open Society Foundation, but there's literally tens of thousands of images I made over the year um, that a lot of people don't see. So I, I think that answers the question a little bit. Thank you. I, I have a question to you. Just, you know, I was, uh, I found it interesting uh, that almost how, how we photograph, I mean, you through uh, the web camera and how you also, you know, got the, the video from the street. It's all the same, you know, they, they don't know we're, we're, you know, taking photos, but because, because of the different purpose, the people, the subject in your photo, for me, it looks all suspect. <laughs> and for your video, yeah, they're anonymous. And for my photo, you know, they're different than mm -hmm. how, how your subject look like. Or did you intentionally edit that? Um, well, I think one of the main differences you're recognizing is that I think yours look a little more neutral and it looks more like a neighborhood photograph and kind of calm light and activity that you would see in a neighborhood. And I think this, you know, your, the videos you shared, it's a lot of cityscapes, but you also have these weird digital overlays and you know, you understand there's an intent other than just looking. Um, I think one of my interests was really kind of looking and investigating the space and watching people and following them over a course of time. And I think the high quality of the camera the device allowed me to zoom in to a point where I was able to really get in tight on people's faces and there's something kind of strange about that, mm -hmm. um, especially when it's highly pixelated and, and the video feed gets choppy and people's faces get cut in half. It takes on a whole different feel and it looks a little violent. So I think even though the images are within the same ballpark of these ideas we're discussing, um, they look drastically different because of kind of how I was approaching it. Mm -hmm. um, and it is strange because mine were taken in public in a neighborhood with, with sunlight and trees and, yeah. and much like yours. Yeah, but exactly. they are wildly different. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, I can't really pinpoint it much beyond that, I mm -hmm. guess. I guess the question was really how does uh, an app like Place Meters, which um, gives you a lot of information that you wouldn't otherwise know at the tip of your hands, um, how does it make life better? Because it, uh, to a certain extent, can reduce social interactions. Did I, did I sum it up right? Okay, great. Um, and uh, I do agree that it could. Um, it, it definitely could reduce the serendipity that, that makes life really magical, um, especially in a city as big as this. But I guess I have a bit more faith in humanity than that. I, I think we're, we're, giving, we're generating data that people can use if they want. Um, we're not really trying to automate people's lives to a certain extent. Uh, so if you want to know how busy Trader Joe's is before you go, if you want um, either a crazy packed bar in that experience, or if you want a silent, um, chill place to hang with your friends, uh, we could tell you which place to go. Um, and that does reduce the serendipity a bit. But if you don't want any of that information, you don't have to consume it. Um, and, I think it I, and I think that people, um, no matter how uh, quantified or data conscious our life is, will constantly seek out those serendipitous moments in cities, and because that's why we live here. Um, so I do agree that there's there's a threat, but I think our, our own humanity might overcome it. You know, I have to say, I think there's an interesting parallel to uh, like surveillance culture and government these days, because they claim they're they're doing a dragnet of all this information and just taking what they really need, but in reality, they have a lot of data that they can use if they want. And like Chris, I'm wondering this data that you were looking at, how much of it was kind of incidentally collected? and not even looked at or considered for what they needed, but they still had access to it. Yeah. And it hurt people's lives. That's, and I think that that's a, a, a super important point, um, is that, um, at least to my knowledge, right, this is a, sort of very hard to quantify because it's years and years and years of sort of legal issues, but nobody was convicted from the, infra from the data set, right? So the data set sort of became this, this sort of massive thing that really 
had no purpose other than to exploit sort of the, the social phenomenon that if you were being watched, you were somebody to be afraid of. And if you became watched, like that was it, you know, like that was, so you're making criminal behavior when most of these people were all abiding to the law. Um, but I think, you know, part of it is also that um, your question is like, sorry, I, I kind of lost my train of thought there. But basically, um, I think what's interesting is that, that, that the point is, is that watching somebody in sort of a social and cultural context um, can be abused and it's more of the action, right? So like, yeah, you know? And the other thing was, that since it became a cottage industry, a lot of the stuff that's in these carpetas are completely false. So if, if, I, if I was an agent and I was watching all three of you um, and you went to a meeting, you know, halfway across the island and I went with you because you were, you know, going to go to this important meeting, I'd put you, both of you there too because I'd make more money. Huh. I'd make three reports instead of one. Wow. And so you start to have people's lives being completely distorted um, and people's lives sort of kind of, you know, it's all in the eye of the beholder, right? And it's sort of, you know, yeah, so that's basically what happens. Wow. Yeah, I mean, so like 185,000, the number varies, but we're, we're given back. Um, the amount of people who pick them up is not really something that's been quantified, um, but it's all word of mouth. So like part of the genesis of the project was also that I grew up sort of knowing that this had happened. Everybody's like, well, you know, don't go to a rally, a student rally, because you'll be watched. Um, but when you sort of look at these documents, it really detonates the severity of what had happened and that it's very real. Um, but, you know, I had to do some pretty sort of heavy research and sort of ask through my social networks to find people who had them and then work through them. Um, because the movement is still very much stigmatized. Um, if you are a member of any of these parties, you, there's sort of a kind of a criminal tinge to it, you know? They, they will extrapolate you know, you being a member of the Green Party to supporting the armed wing of the nationalist movement, which is nowhere near real in most cases. Um, so, so there's also a very strong stigma to this day, so I had to sort of work through the network that I, that I found out. But that said, you know, I, I put out a Facebook message and, you know, everybody was like, oh, my grandmother has one, my cousin has one, oh, my brother's sister has one, you know? So it's, it's also something that is very specific, but also like incredibly per pervasive. Um, and in a country that, you know, sort of had its industrial revolution in the 1940s and 50s, you know, where did all that money come from? Where did those resources go to sustaining all of these people, um, especially the undercover cops that basically would just park themselves outside your car and, and had no real law enforcement um, capabilities? I think Chris makes a really good point, which is that, um, a lot of the negative effects of surveillance aren't necessarily uh, that uh, a cop sees you do something and then you get arrested. It's that you have the stigma, the internal stigma, right. um, mentally, that you're being watched. And that's why, um, it's, that's why it's kind of a brave new world out there to a certain extent because um, with all of the different apps on our iPhones, um, with a variety of, of uh, you know, you're, you're walking around with basically a homing beacon. Um, and people are kind of just realizing that. So building these technologies in a way where, you're, where you don't have that internal stigma while you're walking around is really important. Um, and I think work like yours really uh, uh, conveys that. There were no arrests made, but it, it really affected people's lives. Yeah, I mean, it's the idea, like, in philosophy of the panopticon, right? It's, yeah, the, exactly. it's the jail that, like, you yeah. never know when the guards are watching, and so you, lim you censor yourself. Um, and I think that that's the real fear in the NSA, right? Because, you know, it used to be the FBI agent. You know, if, if you were part of the movement, you sort of, you sort of knew somebody was kind of funky, you know? Somebody showed up to every single rally, and you didn't know who he was. Um, or you did, right? There's also that. But um, I think with the NSA, is you, you have no idea and you don't know what behavior is gonna trigger them watching you. Or the other thing, I mean, it, like famously, I was listening to This American Life, and there's this case of this guy who went to the Apple store, and he's like, ah, oh, you know, I hate the Apple store, because you know, it was like terrible customer service, and he was like, I'm gonna go there and like shoot it up, which is a very like not funny joke. But two hours later, um, an anti-terrorism unit, like SWAT, stormed his apartment, 
and the guy's like a former veteran and like you know he and he's in he at that point he was in legal proceedings to sort of clear his name of like really severe like national security charges mm. for posting something on Facebook which is interesting because Facebook doesn't mine it so somebody must have seen it and said oh you know reported into the cops um, when in fact he wasn't like you know he was nowhere serious mm. about it it was a joke so there's that too so, so on that note I have one question to each of the panelists how do you feel about uh, your own privacy nowadays and and do you do you worry about it do you maintain it do you do something do you like unplug I mean or do you have you given up I, I don't even I don't have a Facebook page so I don't know if that answers the question or not wow. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean I think this is something we're all aware of and I think there are different levels of information that we allow ourselves to put out in the world you know um, I'm here tonight, and people know I'm here tonight, so if anyone wanted to have access to me, they know how to find me. Um, I, I think even through popular media, you know, watching TV shows or movies, that you become very aware that uh, you, there's not, you don't really have many choices in the matter at a certain point. Like, if you, if you call a friend and you use certain words, or you, you're chatting with someone online and you use a string of three words that are totally unassociated, but their keywords on a list somewhere, like you're gonna get a knock on your door. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of frightening. Um, and last week when we had our panel discussions and, and opening receptions for the exhibition, I think it was Simon Menner mentioned before he got on the airplane, he was wondering, um, you know, can you open a door mid-flight? And But then he thought, I shouldn't Google that because I'm about to get on an airplane. Yeah. And if anyone has a record of me having a ticket and me Googling this, I'm gonna get a knock on the door. Yeah. And so I think there, there is a lot of self-surveillance and behavior modification that comes along with being aware that it's even possible. You can't, by the way. I, I've researched it. <laughs> oh, the door. Yeah. And, I mean, it's the pressurization. Yeah, and I would argue that, I mean, I don't know, and my personal belief is that there's no reasonable expectation of, of, of privacy anymore because, I mean, yeah. And, and people also, it's kind of astounding. Actually, there was, a, there was an article in the New York Times about this today about, like, this Pew research that said, you know, it was like half of the people sur sur surveyed in this, in this research, I'm, I hope I get this right, um, basically said that um, they want more privacy, but that they wouldn't modify their behavior at all or wouldn't stop using any of these services. Um, so there's sort of a, pro a paradox where people want more privacy, but they also don't want to give up using any of these, these technologies. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I haven't really modified my behavior, but I'm certainly very aware of it. I mean, I think and the awareness comes from, you know, I mean, in, in, in the 1930s, um, before Nazi Germany, there was a census conducted in Germany um, where people identified their religion. Um, and that was used to persecute um, Jews and people of, of that, you know, by the Reich. So there, the information is out there, and I think what's scary is, is the potential to abuse it, especially down the line. You know, so I don't know. I don't know what to do. You know, right? Yeah, I uh, I haven't modified my behavior at all, and uh, I think what you're referencing also are like the people who buy these like thousand dollar phones that are supposed to be encrypted and uh, the black yeah. phone. Um, I might sound a bit naive, but I do have a bit uh, a little trust in kind of um, at least in America, the American justice system to a certain extent. Um, and I know that doesn't <laughs> win me uh, much favor here, uh, but I, I, I really do believe that um, our constitutional rights are, are, uh, are there, are, are given to us, and um, that given the right um, sort of, and it's not perfect, um, and, and abuse does happen, but um, uh, given the right people who are running it, uh, you can, you can, you can have this kind of pervasive um, information out there, but not a system that abuses it. Um, and I think that's really where the hope is because the, the flood walls have already really opened. Um, so uh, I think one of the things that I really feel um, uh, uh, Edward Snowden did bad for America to a certain extent was it made us um, too cynical, it made us too fatalistic about um, how we, how our government operates, and how we, um, how we're uh, treated by our government domestically, 
Um, and I think there's still hope in that if we involve ourselves in those discussions and conversations and trying to improve civic society, um, that you could create a society where people don't fear surveillance or at least mass surveillance. But maybe that's just me dreaming. No, no. On that <laughs> note, I'm going to wrap up at the School of Visual Arts. There's boxes where every student, staff, faculty member can pick up a copy of the Constitution. Because the president of the school believes greatly in the Constitution and our privilege of voting. And that's the first question he asks incoming class uh, freshmen. Are you registered to vote? And it's one of the last things he says when people graduate. Hmm. A little problem for the international students because they can't really vote. <laughs> but... Um, or if you're Puerto you're, Rican. You're, you're in, um, yes. <laughs> you're you're in a, a, an institution that respects that a great deal. And I respect your time, your insights, your talent, your creativity, and your openness of uh, sharing with all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. But the man on the bottom left-hand corner is having his shoes cleaned, and it's about a 10-minute exposure. So I think this is the first surveillance photo ever made because he didn't give his permission, he didn't know, and now we're all looking at him, which I think is just pretty amazing. And uh, that was from 1838. Now, even in the earliest days of photography, photographers were always looking for new points of view. And here we have Nadar, who uh, worked also in Paris in the 1850s, and he was very interested in aerial photography. Now, back then, aerial photography you had to literally take your wet darkroom with you because everything was collodion prints, uh, plates. And so here he is in his balloon to uh, do aerial photography. It took him three years to develop the process, but I also love compositing. And uh, this is actually how they did that photo. This is his wife. Do you, do you like her expression? <laughs> you know, she's like, what am I doing in this basket hanging from a pole? <laughs> okay. Um, but. Aerial photography in 1906 was incredibly important because it was used to document the destruction of the earthquake in San Francisco. And the photographer that did that, his name was George Lawrence, he used a, uh, a camera that was incredibly heavy and needed 17 to 18 kites to lift it up to take these uh, really stunning panoramic photos of that destruction. So you've got balloons, you've got kites, you have pigeons, <laughs> okay? Where it was actually developed in like 1909 uh, to put this tiny little camera on a pigeon and then it was a program to take a picture every 30 seconds, just like the autographer camera I am wearing today. But I am not a pigeon. First century, we of course have uh, surveillance photography and I just found this out today we know about the, the cameras on the, your storefronts, your lamp posts, airports, et cetera. The University of Washington developing a, a system for cameras to speak to each other. So you know how sometimes when something happens and the police say, do you know this person in this video? And they show like a five second clip from a security camera and then they got, that person's gone. Well, the University of Washington is working on a system that they can recognize you and the cameras will be able to talk to each other so they'll be able to follow you down the street, around the corner, and keep tracking you based on the color of your clothing and how you walk, which is really very, very creepy. So we're being watched, but I think more importantly, we're giving up an incredible amount of information about ourselves. And Eric Snowden said a few weeks ago that if you care about your privacy, you should stay away from Dropbox, Google, and Facebook. But then I would never know what my students or husband are doing. <laughs> All right? So I think in the past, surveillance photography has always been very active looking out, but I think it's very important for us to understand how much information we voluntarily put out there when we search for a vacation spot or the right cream for a skin rash. All right? or when we say what we're doing, or the, M, uh, the GPS information in all of our photos, all right? So there's a lot of very important issues for us to address today, and I'm thrilled that we have a fabulous panel here. I'm going to read their uh, brief bios. Believe me, the bios do not do them justice um, in the order they're gonna be presenting, and then we'll take questions afterwards.
All right, so first to present is going to be Christopher Gregory. Chris says he goes by his base in New York City and he works extensively in his home country of Puerto Rico. His current project, which Chris is showing us tonight, Los Carpeteos, focuses on telling the story of one of the largest surveillance projects conducted by the U.S. government on its own citizens. Okay? Then we have Hei Rung Min, who's a graduate of MPS Digital Photography. Uh, he's a South Korean photographer living and working in New York City. And Hei Rung will be showing work from her project, Channel 247, which aesthetically references surveillance photography. Andrew, Andrew Hammond came in from Boston. He's interested in using photography to interrogate the intersection of technology, privacy, and image culture within America. Andrew will be showing work from the New Town, which is presently included in the Open Societies exhibit, Moving Walls 22, Watching You, Watching Me. And then finally, David Fine is a product manager at PlaceMeter. PlaceMeter was created to give people the power of knowing what a place is like before they get there, which I think is just fascinating. And David has worked in the tech startup and media space in New York, LA, and Dallas, and he'll be showing us what and how PlaceMeter gathers, analyzes, and shares information. So please help me in welcome our first speaker, Christopher Gregory. Okay. And I will start your, I'm, the, I'm also the tech person. Like, great, great. Okay, so I'll just have to do that. Thank you. And thanks everybody for. We're gonna be uh, talking about surveillance photography. It's, uh, it's both creepy and creative, all right? And so we have a fabulous panel here. What I would like to do is I want to give you a little uh, overview first on the, the history of surveillance photography. I'm an educator, got to get some history into it. And then we will be hearing from our panel. And then at the end, we uh, welcome uh, questions. All right, but we're going to hold the questions to the very end. Okay, so uh, the the, the actual term surveillance uh, was derived from a French word. Uh, oh, I need Marco's help. Surveiller, uh, which means to keep watch. All right? And the surveillance camera, as you know, has been used to police borders, assist wartime, to gain advantage over political enemies, or simply to gather information. So this is one lecture where I encourage you to have your cell phones on and tweet. Hashtag SVA digital photo. Okay, now the techniques in surveillance photography are very closely to the development of photographic technology. And the earliest surveillance photos, which we're going to show, to the most recent photography that you know of artists and photographers using uh, Google Maps, Google Glass, and Google Lenses. Now, here is one of the uh, very first, uh-huh. Hang on, there's my presentation, okay. So here's one of the very first images. This is actually the first image of a human being ever done. Now this is Paris and Paris was not empty, okay. <laughs> and um, these pictures were very popular at the World's Fair. I love the vignetting with the wings on the top one, all right. And uh, you can really tell what you're going to get because they didn't really understand composition. And here's a little military pigeon ready to go off. And uh, the camera weighed 1.4 ounces, and it sort of reminds me of a GoPro, right, that we tie to our dogs and penguins and killer whales and things like that. So people have been doing surveillance photography for quite a while. Here in New York City, one of the uh, most important photographers of the 20th century, Walker Evans, developed, oh, he wanted to photograph people in the New York subway without them noticing. And he did this project over the course of uh, four years where he painted his shiny Leica, dark black, and then put the lens through two buttonholes and photographed in the subway because he, th he thought that he liked watching the everyday routines of anonymous people. And you know nowadays everybody would just be looking at their cell phone and would never look at you anyway. So. 
been going on for quite a while. While I was doing researching for this presentation, I couldn't remember this man's name, so I actually Googled creepy photos taken by man with cardboard camera. And uh, Miroslav Chishi popped up. And um, the reason I call him creepy is he built these cameras out of cardboard, and so nobody thought they actually worked. And he would walk around his hometown and hang out at swimming pools and photograph about 100 shots a day. I think he was the first upskirt up photographer. Because this is what he pretty much photographed. So we're getting into the creepy part. So now in the 20